Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the film as much as I did. Um, and I'm very excited to have you back for, we're planning on about 30 minutes of discussion. Um, please post any questions you have in the Q&A box or the chat box, um, and we will uh, monitor that and try to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, I am going to um, give you a fuller introduction of our panelists tonight so you know a little bit more about both of them. Um, David, who uh, you should have heard at the beginning of the presentation, um, uh, is an award-winning journalist who covers the environment and fisheries for the Boston Globe. That's his day job. Um, in, in that role, David has previously covered the war in Kosovo, unrest in Latin America, national security issues in Washington, DC, and terrorism, both in New York City and Boston. Um, that kind of a background apparently prepared him well to grapple with um, whale and lobster politics in the Northeast. Um, his interest in filmmaking in the environment uh, has, has led him to direct and produce a number of award-winning films, uh, which we encourage you all to track down. Track down. Those include Sacred Cow, I'm sorry, Sacred Cod, um, about the collapse of the iconic cod fishery in New England, Lobster War, examining the climate-fueled centuries-old conflict between the U.S. and Canada over an area of rich lobstering waters, and Gladesman, The Last of the Sawgrass Cowboys, which is about the federal government's ban on Florida's iconic airboats in much of Everglades National Park uh, and surrounding Everglades in an effort to repair environmental uh, degradation from the past. Uh, in 2019, uh, David and his co-director and producer of those pre some of those previous projects collaborated again to make Entangled and we're um, very happy to see the results of that tonight. I'm also delighted to introduce Jane Davenport. Jane's a senior attorney with Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, her work at Defenders uh, has been relentless and cutting edge uh, in defense of a wide range of species from mar uh, marine wildlife such as right whales and dolphins, sharks and sea turtles to freshwater aquatic species and bats. Uh, Jane is a recognized expert in the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, among other things, uh, and a really treasured colleague for myself and um, all of us at Defenders. Jane earned a master's degree in environmental studies from the Yale School of Forestry and environmental studies and a JD from Yale Law School. Um, so we're gonna have about 30 minutes of conversation um, in particular, really interested in questions from the audience. So please submit any questions that you have that you would like to ask David and Jane. Um, with that, um, I have a question for David. I'm really interested in um, how Entangled came about. You said at the beginning, in case people missed it, um, you were inspired to try to tell this story um, in long form uh, about a particular species because uh, of your reporting on the, the biodiversity and extinction crisis that's looming. Tell us how, how, how did you come to pick right, right whales and how did you decide film was the right way to tell this story? Uh, yeah, um, it's a good question, thank you. Um, so in some ways, this film was the outgrowth of my previous films that you mentioned. It's kind of like the capstone of a trilogy of films that I've made about how uh, climate change is affecting our um, our oceans, and particularly uh, the Gulf of Maine, which has been warming faster than nearly any other body of water on the planet. And my my interest in telling those stories was so that um, we could show how climate change is not some distant abstract threat, but one that is having a real and significant impact on people's lives now. And so the first um, film, it's funny you said Sacred Cow, because when I first started making making this film, uh, Jane may remember this, but um, at uh, one of the first scenes was at the initial take reduction team. And, um, and I asked uh, someone from NOAA to just tell everybody who I was and why I had cameras there and what I was doing. And he also introduced a Sacred Cow and I had to correct him in front of everybody. Um, but uh, Sacred Cod was a, a film about how um, the warming waters of the Gulf of Maine has uh, led to a collapse of our iconic cod fishery, which is what brought settlers from, uh, from Europe and the pilgrims and sustained uh, generations of fishermen and brought great wealth to New England. 
um, and uh, and to this country in, in its early early uh, years. And um, and so it was pretty uh, um, shocking to a lot of people when all of a sudden uh, the federal government imposed a moratorium on cod fishing. And so um, and there had been years and or decades of pressure on that fishery from uh, overfishing. And it was really, uh, I think scientists say climate change that um, led to the collapse. And then I made a film called Lobster War, which um, was also about how climate change is affecting our ecosystem. And that film uh, um, looks at how uh, climate change in some ways has had the opposite effect. While we've seen a collapse of the lobster fishery south of Cape Cod, uh, to the extent that we've lost nearly 90% of the catch uh, the last time I checked. Um, there has actually been a boom in the lobster fishery north of, in the, the northern uh, eastern parts of the Gulf of Maine. And uh, particularly that boom, um, which arguably is also a function of the warming waters, which has led to a kind of sweet spot um, uh, in that, uh, in this portion uh, of the Gulf of Maine, um, where there is a small island known as, um, it, which is basically a rock uh, that both the United States and Canada have claimed since the end of the Revolutionary War. It's called Machias Seal Island. And nobody really cared about this island until about a decade ago when all of a sudden uh, the waters around that island, uh, which both countries refer to as the gray zone because they both claim those same waters. Once those waters became uh, abundant with lobster, the Canadians who long ceded the waters to the Americans said, hey, uh, those are our waters too and we're gonna fish them. And that led to all kinds of conflict. And when I was making that film, I learned a lot about the impact of, um, of these things called vertical buoy lines, the ropes that extend from the surface to the sea floor, floor um, uh, and their impact on uh, marine mammals and particularly North Atlantic right whales. And as a reporter for the globe, I'd been writing a lot about right whales, but in a piecemeal fashion. Um, and uh, and as I've learned sort of the power that, um, that films can have and how they convene audiences and how they, 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 they kind of command your attention, I thought, um, this is another example um, of how climate change is sort of roiling uh, another very uh, significant industry and a very significant part of our ecosystem. Um, and, uh, and as everybody hopefully just watched, there is significant concerns about how the warming of the Gulf of Maine has led to the collapse of the, um, the primary food source of North Atlantic right whales, a rice-sized creature called Calanus finmarchicus, which um, has pretty much, um, you know, th their populations have declined by uh, some 90% or more uh, in the summer, the primary summer feeding grounds of the whales. And so they had to go elsewhere and they primarily moved from, uh, from near the Bay of Fundy where they fed traditionally up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, in ca Canadian waters and uh, they arrived there in significant numbers for the first time in 2017, when we had a catastrophic loss of the right whales. We lost uh, uh, 12 right whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence that summer at a 17 that we lost altogether. And, um, and arguably that uh, was a function of climate change as well. So anyway, all of these factors um, were things that I'd been writing about uh, and I felt like um, again, as I said, there, with the confluence of this report from the United Nations that this was a really important story to tell. Um, and my hope was that people would recognize the urgency of the crisis for right whales, but also understand that as we make these regulations and as we try to come up with solutions to reduce the serious mortality, the, the serious injuries and mortalities of right whales, that we try to find a way um, to do it uh, so that we don't destroy a vital part of our economy as well. And figuring out how to thread that needle uh, is what this film is about. Um, and it's clearly a very difficult thing to do.
Thank you for that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about um, how to how to uh, save the right well, what's being done and what can be done. I want to ask you one more question about the film before we turn to that. Um, could you tell us a little what, what was most challenging in making the film, the technological, human cooperation, weather, what, what was, tell us a little bit about the process of making the film. Getting Jane Davenport to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jane's very busy. I can understand she's that. She's busy. Yeah. She's exacting. Um, you know, she's tough on you if you don't quite get it right. Uh, no, she, um, she was not a very difficult person to get to talk to. Um, you know, I think the, the challenging part really was ending the film and figuring out how to put a bookend to this because uh, this is a um, a, a, a story that is still unfolding. And um, I thought I had the end of the film when um, in, the, in the final meeting of the take reduction team, we see this historic unprecedented agreement where all but one of the members agrees to take what seem like really hard, difficult decisions um, to, you know, uh, make sacrifices and do something that would make a substantial, you know, uh, make a substantial impact on the future of this species. And there was a lot of um, a lot of grandiose uh, commentary. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, that wasn't the end of the film. When I began to see that there was this huge backlash in Maine, and there was an effort, um, essentially, to uh, rescind their agreement. And, um, and the um, folks in Maine, the congressional delegation, the governor, um, lobstermen, put a huge amount of pressure on the Trump administration to essentially take these rules um, and put them in a kind of regulatory black hole. Um, and the, I was sort of waiting for the outcome of these rules, and they didn't they, they were not uh, released. And um, finally, and then there were several lawsuits uh, that also uh, um, were uh, reached some form of resolution. And so we had to incorporate that toward the end. And so it was really challenging to figure it out. And so we finally last summer decided to put a bookend on the film, but then because of all of these developments, including the federal government releasing the draft regulations on the last possible day that they possibly could um, um, at the end of the year, uh, in large part because of the Defenders of Wildlife lawsuit against uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, they, uh, I, I needed to somehow address that. And there were also other developments. For example, when I started making this film, the estimated population for right whales was roughly 411. Uh, this was in 2019. And then last year, uh, late in the fall, the population estimate was revised to 356. And that was just a huge drop off. Um, and so I also wanted to account for that. So uh, earlier this year, we decided to update the film. And you know, if I if I uh, were to recut the film again, there would I would have to account for other developments, including uh, this thing called the biological opinion. And there's so many; it, it's continuing. So that was really the most challenging thing. That's fascinating. Uh, it is a story that that uh, is rapidly evolving. Um, that's for sure. Uh, well, well, we hope you'll make a sequel um, and keep <laughs> us updated. Um, Jane, um, I, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. We are getting a lot of questions. Um, I think people are looking for some hope um, and some action here. We're getting a lot of questions about some of the technologies, the ruckless technologies that are being mm -hmm. developed. Could you just talk a little bit about the, um, the, the options that we have as a society for addressing some of the, these threats. And particularly, um, there's an interest in some of the technology that's being developed, that'd be great. Yeah, and uh, of course, David's film did a really good job of previewing um, some of those technologies that are, that are in, they're not only in development, they're, are, they're in use. Um, both in the United States and Canada, um, you know, there are a lot of um, forward thinking fishermen who are really motivated by the idea that 
you know, especially when you do have a closure, it's better to be able to fish in that closure than not fish. So um, the Canadian government has been uh, much more nimble in responding to this crisis than the US government has. There have been um, rolling closures in Canada over the past several summers. And you know, that has proved a tremendous incentive to um, fishermen to work with scientists and engineers and the government to get into these closed areas and test these ropeless technologies. And when I, there's not one ropeless technology, there's a bunch of different um, mechanisms that can be used to get a trap or a pot or a trawl, which is a string of trap or pot, from the ocean floor to the surface so it can be retrieved onto a boat. So um, David's film shows the smelts technology, which is these lift airbags. There are other um, technologies where the, the, a flotation device, a buoy and a rope gets put into basically what looks like a lobster trap. And that trap is um, the first on the end of the trawl. And then you set all your traps and you go away and you come back and you send an acoustic signal through a modem and the lid pops off and up comes the buoy and up comes the rope. So you'll still have rope it's just not sitting in the water the entire time you're fishing. So you're only fishing for lobsters. You're not also fishing for whales while you're doing that. So, um, and there's a lot of um, gear retrieval technology that you know the military has been using for dozens of years. And in a lot of ways, it's about bringing the pieces together. It's about taking technologies, um, getting them into the hands of fishermen, you know, and Get, getting their feedback and their innovation to say, well, it doesn't work this way, but let's do it that way. Um, there's um, some of our colleagues in the conservation field are actively working with fishermen. Um, my colleague, Erica Fuller from the Conservation Law Foundation featured in the film, you know, they have gone to the National Marine Fisheries Service and helped get um, experimental fishing permits together so that the government can approve this kind of experimental fishing. So. I, I think you know there's still a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Um, you know, one of there's different purposes of a buoy and a rope, right? It's not only to be able to get your gear back on the boat, but it's also to indicate to other fishermen where your gear is. Because if you're a lobsterman and you've got traps and pots on the bottom, and along comes a guy who is dredging for scallops, if he doesn't know where your gear is, he can drag your gear away, right? So that's there's a gear conflict aspect that we have to be able to solve so that everybody can see the gear that's on the bottom. Um, there's also an enforcement piece of it, right? Because if you're the um, federal government or you're say the Massachusetts Department of Marine Fisheries, you wanna make sure that everyone's complying with the law in terms of their gear. So you know your enforcement boat right now has to be able to go out there and pull the traps and make sure everyone's got their tags. So there's there's, there's components of this that go beyond simply, you know, here's a rope and the rope is how I get my gear. Um, so that's one of the reasons that um, defenders and our allies have been pushing hard um, for the past four years on uh, a bill that's been introduced and reintroduced in the past couple of sessions of Congress called the Save Right Whales Act. And basically what this says is we need federal money to do this, right? This is like a moonshot. I mean, if, if, we're, if we can put people on the moon, we can put federal money into saving the whales. Or more recently, if we can put the rover on Mars, you know, this is the kind of money that we need for this is, is pocket money compared to those kinds of national efforts. But if we have that significant investment of federal money, um, then we can bring the engineers and the fishermen and um, you know the the tech people who can figure out how to make these systems talk to each other. Um, you know we need the government to work on regulations for all of this. So it's possible. It's not here today, but it's also not Star Wars. This is not you know some futuristic. It's not going to happen for 25 years. But it's going to take money and it's going to take political will um, to to make these kinds of innovations happen. Um, and not just for the right whales. Entanglements are a problem all around this country. They are a problem on the West Coast. They are a problem in Alaska. You know, there's a much bigger picture here. Uh, they're a problem around the world. I mean, you know, we have to develop these technologies to bring fishing into the 21st century if we're going to have healthy populations of whales and sea turtles and other, you know, marine life that gets tangled up in these ropes.
I, I would just say I think the the work that both of you are doing, uh, uh, David, to to bring awareness, public awareness, to to these issues and conflicts, and um, Jane, your work on on changing public policy, those are both really valuable ways to to make a difference to get some of these solutions implemented. So I'm really happy that you're both able to talk about those uh, today. Um, uh, Jane, I guess. Um, Talk a little bit about what some of our audience members can do, um, spreading the word, I think, about this film um, and, and about these issues generally. But, but um, tell us, tell the, um, our audience what um, we would recommend, what actions they take. Obviously, there's a lot of information on Defender's website about Right mm -hmm. Whales and about the project. Um, and, and we'll make it easy for people to know how to contact Congress to talk about mm -hmm. the Save the Whales Act. Is there anything else you'd recommend people do uh, to help advocate for these issues? Um, that would be my number one pick, um, you know, and we make it really easy on our website to send an email to your congressperson, but I'll tell you what's even more effective than an email is a phone call um, or a letter, right? Because Congress people respond to their constituents and they respond to their constituents who show they really care. So it's easy to go to congress.gov and look up your representative and call and say, you know, my name is Jane Davenport and I am one of your constituents and I wanna know, are you co-sponsoring the Save Right Wells Act? I wanna know, are you supporting appropriations through the annual appropriations process to work on these technologies, to work on plankton monitoring, to, you know, to work on all these complicated pieces of the puzzle that all have to be solved at the same time. So, you know, truly as individuals, I think that's, um, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and constituent calls to Congress people get attention because they want your vote the next time around. So, um, and it's not just, you know, Congress people in New England. I mean, you know, this, this bill that we've gotten successfully introduced with bipartisan support has gotten um, sponsorship from congressional representatives around the country. So it doesn't matter what, what part of the country you're in, you don't have to be living on the East Coast where the right wells are to make a difference and tell your congressional representatives that they need to support the right whales, they need to support a strong Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act, you know, these fundamental statutory protections for our critically endangered marine wildlife, you know, you can do that from, you know, any of the 50 states in the country. We have someone joining from Idaho today, so that's a good that's a good uh, note. Um, I'd be interested in either both or either of your answers to this. We're getting um, some questions, a lot of questions of about the the fishermen. Um, and um, uh, David, you portrayed a real range of attitudes um, and um, frustrations and experiences uh, on the fishing community. I, I'd be really interested in your thoughts about those those conflicts um, and, and you know, several of our, so we've got several questions about, um, are there ways to compensate the fishermen? Um, are there, uh, Jane mentioned federal funding for, um, for the technology and things like that, but talk a little bit about the conflict um, that you see and ways that we can, um, in addition to regulation about the whales, way, ways that the, the fisheries, the fishermen can be part of the solution if properly incentivized or, or helped or led. Yeah, so I would say, first of all, there is a wide range of views, um, just like on the other side, there's a wide range of views about how to address this problem. So, um, uh, you know, Jane has a different view than other uh, environmental advocates have about how to either coerce or pressure the government to take action. Uh, but I think lobstermen, um, you know, uh, I think they're the fishermen that we um, that we follow in the film. Uh, I chose him, Rob Martin, and his partner, Lori Karen, uh, because uh, first of all, they are the most affected uh, people uh, by uh, existing or previous uh, whale regulations. Their fishery has been closed uh, for uh, several months a year uh, for some seven or eight years now. And so they've, you know, um, had to learn the hard way that you know, if they don't pay attention and don't try to get involved and try to figure out how to solve the problem, uh, they're just going to be left behind. And so Rob, uh, like some of uh, some other fishermen, has been testing ropeless gear. 
and uh, and we increasingly see in Canada uh, fishermen who are also having their fisheries closed, also testing ropeless gear. And so, in some ways, uh, if mother, uh, if necessity is the mother of invention, um, closures uh, like the ones uh, that just took effect this year. So one of the things that's not included in the film, when I said that it was a hard thing to put a bookend on, um, one, of the, one of the other developments that, um, that occurred uh, since the film ended was that starting this winter, um, in part because of legal pressure and in part because of the onset of these federal rule, anticipating these federal rules, the state of Massachusetts closed nearly its entire lobster fishery, not just the area around Cape Cod Bay, um, but extended it all the way up to the border with New Hampshire and around um, to parts of Cape Cod to essentially ban lobster fishing when whales are in the vicinity from February through May or until the whales are no longer in our, uh, clearly seen in our waters. Um, and so now there's a lot of interest uh, from fishermen here about testing ropeless fishing. And there are now studies and, um, and calls for ropeless fishing, which is actually technically illegal um, to be used in a commercial way uh, right now because, and Jane can talk about this, uh, because right now, you know, uh, to get a permit to fish, you need to agree to abide by specific practices and use specific kinds of gear. And lots of folks have been urging the state of Massachusetts and the federal government uh, and other states to, to change the rules to allow fishermen to start using this other kind of gear. And I think in the next year or two, we will likely see that in the federal rules. Jane can talk about this as well, uh, which are supposed to finally be released um, um, sometime this summer are also likely to allow for some kind of testing uh, in a new closed, in two new closed areas that will, um, will likely be part of the final rules. Uh, but the point is that, um, you know, if, there's, if there are closures and there are more significant regulations, then it seems like fishermen will have more incentive to start uh, testing and using the system. That all said, the critical problem is while Jane noted that this technology is, is, uh, has matured quite significantly in recent years and uh, is viable um, for the most part, it is still really expensive. And so for a lobsterman uh, who, uh, you know, is at, at the whim of changing prices, um, at, at the whim of mortgage payments on his or her boat, uh, and, you know, who, uh, you know, is, is always sort of, you know, at the mercy of all kinds of expenses, fuel costs, bait costs, um, having to spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to, to completely change the way they fish and way the, their parents fished and their grandparents fished um, and to re-outfit their 800 traps to use ropeless gear would be very expensive. And so ultimately, we, in order for this fishery to really make the transition, as Jane said, we're going to need some kind of government support for that transition. Great, thanks. Um, we have so many questions in the chat. I, we are not going to be able uh, to get to all of them, um, though we will certainly try to respond um, separately to, to as many of them as we can. Um, I, I wanna ask um, one question of both of you. Um, over the course of all of your work on, um, on right whales and on uh, fisheries generally, Tell me the most surprising thing about um, whales that you've discovered and the most surprising thing about the people that you've worked with. Uh, Jane, you're on the um, spot first. So it's my mission in life that no one ever, ever used the phrase gentle giants when it comes to whales or manatees. I mean, we as humans, you know, we tend to say, oh, well, a, a whale is a gentle giant. Well, that's because it doesn't have large teeth like a shark and it's not gonna take a bite out of you. But we have to respect that these are really strong and powerful 
animals. And, you know, David's film sh uh, shows, um, you know, footage of Joe Hallett, who was a dedicated and innovative Canadian fisherman who, who spent so much of his time on disentanglement, right? Like fishing was his real job and disentanglement was his, his, his passion and his public service. And it wasn't the whale's fault and it wasn't Joe's fault and he was killed by a whale. So I think we need as humans to respect that these animals in nature they have their own agendas and it's not about us, right? They're not there to, you know, have awesome photographs with a scuba diver, you know, don't, don't ever approach a whale. Number one, it's illegal, but two, it's dangerous. Um, so, you know, I, I think what's so amazing is this is the most studied whale population in the world. You saw the um, footage of, of Amy Knowlton and her colleagues um, taking pictures and documenting and having books of all these whales where they, they have names, they, they can be identified. And yet we don't know where most of them are for a good chunk of the year, right? Like the closure in Cape Cod is built around when, you know, a full one quarter of the population is there feeding. Where are the other three quarters? We don't know. We can't tag, tag and track whales. You know, we can't low jack them like we could a car because, um, you know, the tags are too um, injurious to a whale. You can't tag a whale like you can a bird or a fish. So we don't, we don't know where they go. So there's, um, I guess, you know, to just sum that up, there's so much mystery about them. Like they're trying to live the life that they've lived for a million years plus. And, you know, we're, we know so much about them and yet we still know so little. And we have to respect that they have their own lives and their own way of being in the world. And in my view, we need to figure out how to get out of their way and, and stop killing them, right? Like, you know, we may not be going out and harpooning them anymore, but we're running over them. We're catching them. You know, we, we've polluted their environment with so much noise, they can't hear themselves think. Um, I saw a pop up in the, uh, uh, the um, chat. Uh, sharks um, have cartilaginous fins. So, you know, you, you, you can put like a piercing in your ear, like a cartilage piercing in your ear, it's not going to hurt you. For a whale, you have to tag them by shooting into their blubber and that introduces infection. So, you know, there's so few right whales, um, you can't tag them because it's just simply not safe because you could actually kill them eventually if you did that. I would just add to that. So one of the most surprising things to me when I started making this film and, you know, knew very little about uh, marine mammals, let alone right whales, was it seemed like a simple solution. Uh, why don't you just tag? Why don't we just sort of tag each of them? They're like 400 or so left. Let's just, you know, we, we can, you know, monitor where they go and, and, you know, we track them pretty closely from the air and from sea. Uh, but it, it's, it goes beyond that. The problem, as it was explained to me, is that they have actually tagged some right whales. Uh, and there have been tags that have been developed uh, that aren't necessarily causing infections, but they don't stay on. The whales, uh, like, go down to the sea floor and kind of, like, rub them off. Um, and apparently they don't stay stay on very well. I still, uh, I still am skeptical and think that there could be some kind of way to, to like wrap it around a, uh, like a tail or a fluke. I, I don't know. Uh, I obviously it's above my pay grade, but, um, uh, I would love to see some sort of invention that would make it easier for us to track them because that could potentially solve a lot of problems. Um, but I would say for me, um, uh, um, uh, the, the more surprising issue was just how different the Canadian system of addressing these issues are, um, is than then the American system. And as I started making this film and I was watching the take reduction team process, I was just really impressed. It, it, I was just like, this is, this is democracy in action. This is you know, this wonderful example of our federal government convening stakeholders from the fishing industry and from scientists and state and local uh, government officials and federal officials and all coming around the table and being given a mission and coming up with 
really hard, you know, have, facing really hard choices and coming up with serious solutions. And I was like, wow, that was impressive. And then I saw the dysfunctional side of how that can be played, that system, and how it can be drawn out and how, uh, and how on, uh, in this weird way, uh, the only thing that really prods the system into action is, is lawsuits. And that seems like a whole kind of crazy way to make policy um, when you know it gets stymied and you have to coerce it through lawsuits. Whereas the, the Canadian system on the outset seems almost authoritarian in that it's essentially a very top-down system where a minister, like a group of ministers will come together and they might listen to their, you know, constituents in the fishing industry, or they might, you know, may, maybe be too influenced by the fish, by, by fishermen. Um, but they, um, they come together and whatever their interests are, they make decisions. And those decisions can be put on the water with so-called, they like to say, with the swipe of a pen. And... Um, and so after the, the 17 right whales died in 2017, um, and 12 of them in Canadian waters, um, by the next fishing season, the Canadian government had uh, a serious regime of closures and other regulations to protect the whales. Then, of course, they eased up on them. Uh, the next year. And then in 2019, we saw nine of the 10 right whales that died that year um, uh, in Canadian waters, in part because they eased up on those rules. But then they, they clamped down again. And last year, there were no right whales that were found dead in Canadian waters. Uh, and so far this year, there haven't been any that we know of, at least. So in short, the thing that was really surprising to me is that, you know, there are just very different ways, ways of approaching this. And two and a half years now after the, the federal government launched this urgent quest to try to solve this problem, we still have no rules in effect that are uh, taking serious action to try to reduce serious injuries and mortalities of right whales. Oh, it goes back longer than that. We've had no new regulations in the United States on um addressing fishing gear entanglements since 2014. And, you know, it was 2017, even it was April, 2017, before we started seeing, you know, the death toll just climb crazy that, um, you know, the, the NIMS um, right well population biologists came to the meeting of the take reduction team and told us that, you know, we thought that right whales were on the increase, you know, from the conservationist point of view, it was slower than it should be, but we still thought that births were outnumbering death and that the population was growing. And that was when, you know, the atomic bombshell dropped and we found out that the species has actually been in decline since 2010. And I do want to mention here that obviously the, the focus of our whole discussion is about entanglements. Um, and entanglements are only part of the problem. Um, and, you know, we also have to recognize that um, it's not just entanglements, it's vessel strikes as well. Um, and, you know, we need to put pressure on the federal government to expand what's called the vessel speed rule. It's basically like um, slow zones for schools, right? Like you have, you know, areas where they, where they know right whales are you know, they ask vessels or they require vessels to slow down because then the whales can get out of the way, right? So, you know, we're not going to solve this just this this extinction crisis just by looking at entanglements. We have to look at vessel speeds. We have to look at um, ocean noise pollution. Um, one of the most interesting, but also just the most tragic um, studies that I've read about the right whale. You know, there's a there's a ton of work done on whale poop. I mean, they, they collect whale poop, they'll have sniffer dogs and they'll collect it and they can, they can test hormones, right? They can, they can get all sorts of information from, from whale poop. Um, and a researcher um, was doing some of these collection studies on right whales when 9-11 happened, right? And, and everything shut down, right? All of a sudden there's no planes, there's no boats. Every, the world just came to a halt. And 
you know, she was doing the research and got sort of like the before 9-11, after 9-11, when there was that giant silent pause and all the stress hormones in the whales just plummeted. They were like, oh, I can hear myself think, right? And then of course it all ramped back up again. So you think about, you know, like um, what it's like to be a right whale where you can't communicate with each other. There's just this cacophony of ocean noise going on all the time. And, you know, we're humans, we depend mo mostly on our sight and not on our hearing. So we don't have that same kind of like everything in the world depends on our hearing for at least many people. Um, but think about what that's like to be a right whale when, when you can't hear yourself think, when, you know, you're, you're, you're getting hit by ships, you're getting entangled by these ropes. Like we as humans are responsible for all these things. And it doesn't mean we're evil or bad. That's why it's called incidental take. It's an accident. No one's intending to do this, but we have to be more conscious of how, you know, our ways of life, our ways of making a living are affecting, you know, these species in the world around us. Well, um, we are, um, we're running a little past time. I think we, um, we all could stay uh, and talk for a lot longer about right whales. Um, I, you've both done a tremendous job. Um, at David through the film and Jane um, through your work and through talking about all the different ways we can get involved in this. Um, we, we really, I encourage all of you to, um, uh, again, look at, take a look at Defender's website. Jake has posted the, the link in our, um, in the chat, but you can also just find it on our website to learn more about right whales and what you can do to help them. And really encourage you to, one of the best ways to get excited about these issues and to learn how to be, um, uh, more involved is to 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 watch uh, products like uh, like this film and share information about it with uh, your friends and connections. Um, I think with that we're going to close. Uh, David, I, I did want to ask if there's anything you want to tell us about your next project. We hope it has something to do with whales, and we're really glad you picked uh, that you picked whales from all the topics you certainly could have covered. Anything else you want to tell us? Um, Thank you. Uh, I did write a story today about the in today's Boston Globe about the lobster uh, diver who was uh, ingested by the whale. So, uh, so I, not I, ingested. Not ingested, ingested. is on, different than swallowed. Into ingested, <laughs> ingested into the mouth, not necessarily through the esophagus. So I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go look that one up. Continue to use the word ingest. But um, <laughs> that, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll let that one go. Um, uh, but I do like to note uh, that uh, the, the whale chose the guy who was not using vertical buoy lines. So the lobster <laughs> um, in uh, a bit of irony. Um, I, I have uh, actually just started working on a new film and, um, and I'm, I'm not going to say too much about it yet, but it's climate change related, uh, but, and uh, it has, has to do with sea level rise um, and trying to reflect uh, the, uh, the challenges uh, of, uh, of us sort of making decisions that uh, will have ramifications in the decades to come and how we choose to live by the sea and that sort of thing. So. Uh, that's uh, that's a project I'm just starting um, and laying the groundwork for now. I just shot my first scene this week, so. Well, that's that's fantastic. We all look real forward to seeing that, and hope you'll come back and talk to us about it again. Um, I, I want to respond to one uh, to, uh, on on the note about climate change. Want to res and responding to one of the questions in the um, in the chat earlier um, about um, whether people were. Um, whether we felt like people were more engaged in environmental issues in the US these days. Um, and, and I wanted to say, I think climate change has had a really profound impact on younger people and on a really diverse audience of people and has brought a lot of new people into the environmental movement. Um, I think we, it, it's in my adult lifetime, climate, uh, an environmental issue hasn't been on the agenda of the president of the United States. And climate is is front and center on the Biden administration's agenda. So uh, that the issue is is very serious and very profound. And um, as I'm sure David's going to tell us, could have ruinous effects on all of us. But it has also mobilized a broader um, constituency 
um, that's really looking in a very intersectional way about environmental issues. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that bringing uh, attention uh, to these issues and getting more and more people involved really can um, matter in our politics and in our um, the way we run public policy. And I hope you're all seeing that too. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for joining us tonight. David, thank you so much for sharing uh, this film with us, for making this film and for taking the time to speak to us about it. Jane, thank you for, um, for all the work that you do and for sparring with David and everyone else in the film um, that we saw. And, and huge thanks to our audience for those of you who are sticking with us and for everyone who joined um, for your really thoughtful questions and ideas. There are lots of really good ideas um, uh, in the chat that we're gonna uh, take a look at too. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. I hope everybody spreads the word uh, to your friends and family about the film. And uh, I think someone, from uh, the uh, defenders will be sharing links that you can, where you can share the film uh, in the future. I think that's right. Great. Thanks everybody. Have a great Thank night. Everyone. Good night. Thanks so much.